years. As you've probably heard by now, the first quake registered 7.4 on the Richter scale. That's three times stronger than the quake that killed 70 people three years ago in San Francisco. However, this time only one person was killed because the quake was centered in a sparsely populated area near the small town of Joshua Tree that's far east of Los Angeles. Still, Southern Californians are wondering what could happen next. So throughout the program this morning, we will be looking at many of the questions raised by earthquakes. And also this morning, military sources say the Navy is ready to begin leveling charges in connection with that sexual assault scandal at a Navy convention in Las Vegas. We'll get more information this morning from Senators John Warner and Sam Nahn of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Spencer? Well, Barbara, destructive uh, weather conditions continue to pummel the Southland from the Texas Panhandle, where tornadoes like these, which occurred over the weekend, could we develop today to Florida, where persistent rain will continue to cause flooding like this near Sarasota. Hmm. And first we go to Aaron Brown, who is filling in for Mike Schneider with the news. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Bar Barbara. And we have reports now of yet another earthquake. A 5.6 earthquake has hit within the hour. It hit on the California-Nevada border about 75 miles uh, to the west of Las Vegas. We have no reports yet of damage or injuries. We are tracking that. This comes after a night of aftershocks, hundreds of them in Southern California. Nothing, of course, to compare to the two quakes that struck yesterday morning. 300 people hurt, hundreds of homes damaged. Many people chose to spend last night outside, away from the possibility of crumbling walls. Both of the earthquakes yesterday hit east of Los Angeles. The first one near Joshua Tree, California, 7-4 on the Richter scale. And then three hours later, quake number two, 6-5. Here's ABC's Brian Rooney. The first quake lasted longer and was more powerful than most Californians have ever experienced. Some walls fell and the roof of a Kmart caved in. Route 247 was cracked and broken. The fissures ran for miles by the highway. The second quake raised clouds of dust out of the San Bernardino Mountains. Close to Big Bear Lake, a house burned in the woods. Most of the injuries were minor, but one three-and-a-half-year-old boy died of head injuries. The damage was light for a quake of this size, but some people lost everything. All, but my shop is gone. My shop right there. I do upholstery and it's gone. I have to build another one. God's watching over us. We're all right. The whole family's okay. That's the most important thing. Who cares about that? We can fix that. Yeah, really. People lined up to buy food. Governor Pete Wilson declared an emergency and said the state would help in spite of its financial crisis. The only encouragement I can give them is that the state will respond working with local communities to see that the communities are as safe as we can make them. But uh, no one can profess to you that we can safeguard anybody against earth movement. Even as he spoke, there was another aftershock. Despite cautions about another quake, seismologists said if nothing happens, it should be safe for Southern Californians to return to normal life today. Brian Rooney, ABC News, Yucca Valley, California. And it does sound like the people in the damaged areas will be getting some help from Washington for cleanup and rebuilding, President Bush says. He has been in touch with Governor Pete Wilson and that he has promised to do whatever he can. Again, another quake this morning, five, six on the Richter scale about 75 miles west of Las Vegas on the California-Nevada border. In other news for both sides of the abortion debate, today looks like the day. The day the U.S. Supreme Court is supposed to issue its decision in the Pennsylvania abortion case. And the expectation is the court will uphold at least some of the restrictions in that law. Maybe not all of them, but some. And if the court does that, it will weaken to some degree Roe versus Wade, the landmark case that legalized abortion in this country in 1973. The body of a missing Exxon executive, Sidney Riso, has now been found, found buried in New Jersey's remote Pine Barrens. The New York Times reports that Riso had been shot in one arm. He also had a heart condition. A former Exxon security officer and his wife have already been charged with his kidnapping. Now one or both of them will likely face a murder charge as well. An extraordinary medical story to report this morning. Doctors have for the first time put the liver of a baboon into a human, a 35-year-old man in this case. They used the liver of a baboon because the hepatitis B the man has would have wound up infecting a human liver, and they are in short supply. The transplant ended overnight at a hospital in Pittsburgh. The man listed in critical condition this morning. 
Overseas this morning, Serbian forces say they have turned over the Sarajevo airport to UN peacekeepers, a transition that won't bring peace to the Bosnian capital, but may at least bring some supplies in. And in the Serbian capital of Belgrade, the government is under pressure to bring an end to the civil war. Here's ABC's Mike Lee. Anti-government protesters remained in the city center of Belgrade this morning after refusing to leave the scene of a rally yesterday. They accused the Serbian president Slobodan Milosevic of leading Serbia into isolation from the rest of the world. The Serbian government, which controls the Yugoslav National Army and police, is trying to prevent other republics from becoming independent. Protesters at yesterday's demonstration denounced the regime for supporting ethnic Serbs who were fighting against breakaway republics like Bosnia-Herzegovina. The latest protests here are provocative challenges to President Milosevic to resign or risk confrontation with the growing number of Serbs who are suffering because of international economic sanctions. In the war zone itself, French President Francois Mitterrand arrived in Sarajevo yesterday. It was a daring gesture calculated to boost the morale of civilians trapped by Serbian gunmen and to pressure other Western nations into moving ahead with an airlift of relief supplies. But the French leader found out the hard way that snipers can still make the airport dangerous. Mitterrand was forced to put on a combat flak jacket when gunmen from a Muslim area fired upon Serbs at the airport. Three Serb soldiers were wounded and one of Mitterrand's aircraft reportedly was hit by a bullet. The French president later escaped back to Paris leaving the airport situation and the issue of relief flights very much in doubt. Serbian forces in Sarajevo claim that they have handed over control of the airport to the United Nations. But the UN commander there is skeptical that renegade gunmen will automatically honor that diplomatic nicety. This leaves the question to be pondered today at the UN Security Council of whether the West should use force to reopen the Sarajevo airport. Mike Lee, ABC News, Belgrade. And finally here, a quick program note. Join ABC's Peter Jennings tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Time for a special broadcast, Who is Ross Perot? An hour-long look at Mr. Perot's record and his undeclared presidential campaign so far. Then at 11.30, Ross Perot joins Peter Jennings live in the studio to take questions from viewers and from an audience here in New York and in 10 other cities. Starts tonight at 10, and that's the news until now. Joan and Spencer. All right, thank yeah. you very much, Aaron. It's eight minutes after seven right now. That's time for the weather. Spencer's back from vacation, and you've got yep. one active map this morning. <laughs> Have we ever? Things just got all out of control while I was away, yeah. so it'll probably take me this first week back to straighten them out again. All right. <laughs> Let's take a look at some video, uh, Joan, from the Texas Panhandle over the weekend where dozens and dozens of tornadoes were reported. And this is home video taken by some residents uh, of this area. This is around Fitch, Texas, up in the Panhandle. Tornadoes struck on Saturday and Sunday, and hailstorms as well. This near the town of Hereford, Texas. Large tennis ball size hailstones in this storm. Uh, it was a very, very messy and stormy weekend in the Texas Panhandle, and it looks like it's going to remain that way today as we uh, Take a look at the satellite. You see the latest satellite showing large area of thunderstorms rumbling through eastern Texas and into the lower Mississippi Valley during the overnight and early morning hours. Uh, the storms are dissipating now, but it looks like uh, later today, after a sunny start, the storms will redevelop in this area, and there's a chance for more dangerous weather here. The outlook for the nation calls for a calm morning, as I said, but uh, it'll be a stormy day. Oh, my gosh. Now, it's going to be a stormy day down in the southern plains of the lower Mississippi Valley as the day goes on. And then across the Gulf Coast, we'll see afternoon thunderstorms developing after a sunny morning. It'll be sunny throughout the day in the north central states and cool Canadian air filtering down into that region behind this cold front, which may usher in a shower or two yeah. as it slices eastward and southward. Oh. It's cooling off in the northwest as well under cloud cover and rainy conditions. Yeah. It'll be nice and sunny and hot down in the southwest. High temperatures in the southern Rockies and the desert south southwest will reach into the 90s and 100s, only in the 60s across much of the northern tier of states. That's a look at the national weather picture. Here's a look at the weather where you are. Hi there, everybody. I'm Rick Mitchell with a local look at your weather. We will have a cold front crossing the state today. It's pretty weak, so that by the time it gets here, we will just have an isolated chance for a thunderstorm. Most of us are going to remain dry. The big shower activity will be well down to our south. Highs today from here on to the south will be in the 80s, but on the north side of the front in the 70s. Your forecast for Des Moines calls for a mixture of clouds and sunshine today. An isolated afternoon thunder shower is possible. Most areas staying dry, though. Today's high, 81.
All right, thank you, Spencer. Ten minutes after right now, as you just heard, two powerful earthquakes jolted Southern California on Sunday. They've been having aftershocks ever since. People there are trying to piece their lives back together, even as they grapple with the possibility that there may be more quakes to come. Richard Andrews is the director of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services for the state of California, and he joins us now from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. Mr. Andrews, good morning. Good morning. How bad is the damage there, and what are the steps being taken now by the Governor's Office? Well, we estimate at this point that the damage is in excess of, uh, of $20 million. Uh, as you know, that there's been one fatality, uh, approximately 373 people injured, uh, 10 homes uh, destroyed, uh, about 11 or 12 businesses, over 13 hum 1,300 homes that have been um, affected. Uh, so the, the, the damage, particularly in San Bernardino County, has really been, uh, been quite substantial. We have engineering teams that will be in the field today uh, continuing this assessment. Uh, Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation, has been working to open the highways. All but one of the roads up into the mountains uh, are currently open. There's still one closed, and it will probably be closed through much of the day. Uh, I suppose our biggest concern is the ongoing aftershocks and the longer-term implications of this whole sequence that we've seen uh, along the southern portion of the San Andreas in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Well, there have been a number of aftershocks, some of them significant. What are you advising residents at this time to, to cope with this? Well, particularly for the residents in the San Bernardino uh, County area, uh, we're advising them to, uh, to just exercise caution. We've list lifted the, uh, the recommendation that we put out yesterday morning for people to uh, stay off of the freeway system in that area. Uh, Caltrans has completed their inspections of the freeway system. Right now, uh, it's pretty much intact. But because of the continuing risk of landslides uh, <coughs> in the mountainous areas, uh, we're advising people there to exercise uh, to great caution. Again, our concern about about a, a large magnitude event that is an event over magnitude six has started to, to decline a little bit, but this is clearly a very active sequence, both in terms of the size and in terms of the number. So we continue to, uh, to urge caution on the part of the people and to just take standard earthquake preparedness measures. I saw in several stories that came across the wires a boil alert to boil water. Is that only in certain areas? It's only in certain areas. Uh, there are currently, I think, four water districts uh, that have the boil alert in effect, uh, largely as a consequence of, of what we know were a large number of breaks in, in the various water systems. San Bernardino County, uh, as much of that uh, desert area of Southern California, has a number of independent water companies. And so we'll be working very closely throughout the day uh, with San Bernardino County and, and our own state officials uh, to make sure not only that the, the currently available water supply is safe to drink, but also starting to look at the longer-term water needs in that area. As you know, it's very, very warm in that part yeah. of uh, California this time of the year. You just said the, the possibility of a, another larger quake seemed to be subsiding, and yet we just saw this one of 5.6. I believe that was on the California-Nevada border, what, 57 miles or so west of Las Vegas? Right, I believe so, within the last hour. And how, how bad was that as far as affecting populated areas? We have no information at this point that there was any damage to uh, to any of the uh, to any of the populated areas. We continue to have uh, staff here at the uh, Caltech Seismological Laboratory as we have had since shortly after the first uh, earthquake at five o'clock yesterday morning. As you know, there's been a there's been a great deal of discussion and some uncertainty within the scientific community, both about the size and location of yesterday's events and about the longer term implications. And and we will continue the dialogue. Uh, with the scientists here in, in, in California that we've had going on for the last five to six years regarding the implications of these events and what we should be saying to the public. All right. Richard Andrews, thank you very much for joining us from California. My pleasure. Coming up, the leaders of the Senate Armed Services Committee on the sex assault scandal reported by a Navy lieutenant when Good Morning America continues. And when I did break free, I... This is Mako's Ambassador Paint Service. Just $199. We professionally prepare your car. We chemically clean it, surface sand it, and give it a high-grade oven-baked enamel finish from over 7,000 colors. All backed in writing at over 400 centers coast-to-coast. -coast. Mako's Ambassador Paint Service. The best value for your money. Just $199. If you want high-quality work for this kind of price, you better get Mako. Every month. Enter the world of fine interior design. Enter the fascinating world of architectural digest. View a pied-à-terre in Paris. A noted fashion designer's rustic Montana ranch. A renowned artist's Hudson River farmhouse. And an English designer's bright and airy London home. 
Every issue of Architectural Digest will enlighten and inspire. You'll discover how the world's top interior designers help their clients capture their personalities in their homes. You'll also visit celebrity homes, like Michael Douglas's dramatic Manhattan hideaway, or Neil Simon's Malibu Beach House. And you'll keep up to date with insightful features on architecture, art, and antiques. Call now and get 12 issues of Architectural Digest for only $29.95. You'll also receive absolutely free Celebrity Homes Revisited, a tour that includes the homes of Jeffrey Bean, Pavarotti, and Cher. Call toll-free 800-233-8700. That's 800-233-8700. There's nothing like a trip to Adventureland, especially on the 4th of July. And this year, Farmland Foods and Channel 5 are teaming up to offer you a great deal. All you need to do is save the label from any Farmland Foods product. The labels are worth a $3 discount per person at Adventureland on the 4th. So enjoy Farmland fine products and have a great 4th. Courtesy of Adventureland, Farmland Foods, and Channel 5. It is an ugly and embarrassing chapter in the history of the armed forces. Reports of sexual assault at a convention of Navy flyers last fall forced the resignation of Navy Secretary H. Lawrence Garrett. And later Friday, President Bush met with Lieutenant Paula Coughlin, who says that she was attacked by fellow officers at the Tailhook Convention. The President assured her of a full investigation. Joining us this morning from Washington is Democratic Senator Sam Nunn, Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and here in New York, the ranking Republican on the committee, Senator John Warner, who is also a former Secretary of the Navy. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Senator Nunn, let's begin with you. Bob Zelnick, uh, ABC's Bob Zelnick, is reporting that the Navy is ready to file assault charges against six officers. Can you confirm that for us? No, I can't. I have not uh, been briefed on that. Well, your committee has delayed the promotion of more than 4,500 officers in the Navy and the Marine Corps until, until they can be cleared of involvement. If some of these officers were involved, what action do you take? What kind of punishment do they get? The action would be first a convening authority to receive the report from the Inspector General of the Department of Defense. Second, that authority would decide, based on the facts developed by the Inspector General, whether to begin court-martial proceedings, and if so, of what type. The kinds of charges could range anywhere from uh, the charge of sexual assault mm -hmm. or indecent assault all the way to uh, conduct on becoming an officer and perhaps even obstruction of justice. It just depends on the facts. This could take months, years, couldn't it? 4,500? Well, the 4,500 is the total number of people before our committee. Uh, we hope to be able to clear most of those. The overwhelming numbers of those would not have even been at the Tailhook mm -hmm. Association. So you're talking about probably uh, 50 to 100 people, depending on the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Warner, uh, there have been some reports that uh, the Admiral of the Navy uh, should resign, as well as the Secretary of the Navy, who already has Admiral Kelso. What is your view oh, of that? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, three reasons. First, uh, Secretary of Navy stepped up and met his responsibility in the finest traditions of the sea. And that is that a captain is responsible even though he's off the bridge and resting. And he stepped up and said, I'll take responsibility. Okay, so shouldn't That's an admiral do that no, as well? No, absolutely not. Three reasons, Barbara. First, uh, A, the Secretary has done it. That sent the signal throughout the fleet that we're serious from the President on down to stop this type of activity throughout the armed forces of the United States. Second, uh, there are two major parts of this problem. Not only the assaults that took place at the convention, but subsequently there too, how the investigation was conducted. Uh, Monday morning quarterbacking now, it probably wasn't done properly. And the secretary accepted that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And third, Admiral Kelso is one of the finest men ever to head the United States Navy. And he's fully capable and has the support of his people to straighten this thing up. Remember, there's 65,000 men and women officers in the Navy. This is only a handful that caused this problem. Senator the Nunn, of course, it is the bigger problem. How do you change, uh, not just society in general, as we've seen it changing in the last years, but how do you change the armed services? What kind of education do you do to change a whole point of view? And beyond that, what do you do immediately? Do you decide to have more women on ships? Does that help it? Does that make a situation like this uh, 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 less apt to occur? 
I don't think the number of women uh, is the determining factor in, a, in an incident like this, because in this case, uh, this conduct would have been totally inexcusable 30 years ago or 50 years ago. You might not have heard of it then. Well, it depends on leadership. At some junctures in our history, this would have been a very serious offense. It depends on the leadership at the time. For instance, there are some generals in the past that would have had this kind of conduct. Uh, the people involved, if they were guilty, shot at dawn. There are others who would have ignored it. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to straighten this out with education and leadership. But I'm confident, Barbara, it can be done because we've done it in the military, I think, in a great fashion in terms of racial equality and equal treatment of all races and also the military better than any other segment of our society has dealt with the narcotics problem. Senators, while we have time, I, I want to ask you a question about mm -hmm. Yugoslavia, which uh, it, it continues to be one of the most devastating um, uh, wars that are going yeah. on. It's reported today that President Bush and the European leaders are discussing the use of military force to break the civil war and also to get aid to the people, and that the issue faces the UN Security Council today. What does this mean to us? Does this mean force? Does this well, mean air cover? What? The President, again, is trying to take a leadership role. This is primarily a problem of the EC, the European community. And it would not be my judgment that the United States would put ground troops in. We would provide, together with other forces within the UN umbrella, a logistical support, food and so forth, and transportation, but maybe some air cover. Okay, air cover. Our men and women can get killed in air cover. Well, that's quite true. Yeah. But let's also remember this is a civil war and the, the Yugoslavs have a history going back to Tito of being some of the most fierce partisan fighters. We'd better be cautious. We just have a few moments, Senator Nunn. How would you feel about the use of American force? I agree with what Senator Warner said. I think, I uh, hope our forces will primarily be used for air transport and air cover, which are very important. But putting American forces on ground could inflame the situation because of some perceptions there in Yugoslavia. But we ought to do our part, and certainly we want to help in every humanitarian way we can. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. We appreciate you both being here. And Good Morning America continues in just a moment. Alexander's Photo Center is more than just a camera store. Of course, we have new and pre-owned camera equipment, film, photo finishing and accessories, camera repairs, passports, and friendly help, but also you